Hello, Fed Retirement Planning community. This is Cooper with FedRetirementPlanning.com. If you haven't checked out the site yet, do so here. In the meantime, I'm gonna talk about something that I've been meaning to talk about for a while, I've hinted about talking about for some time, and I think it's gonna be a really good episode for you guys, and it's gonna be specifically talking about the fees that the Thrift Savings Plan has. Just some time ago, I made a video called The Biggest Fed Federal Retirement Mistake. This was a mistake that I saw being made more than any other. Um, I also had an article if you wanna check that out. Clip up, click the video up here. Uh, but that video basically entailed that the mistake that a lot of federal employees were making was not contributing up to the match that they received from the federal government for the thrift savings plan. That match is 5%. And far and away, the argument that I get the most for people saying, well, why don't you suggest people invest above and beyond the match um, is that the TSP has such low fees. And without a doubt, that's a great argument. The thrift savings plan has some of, if not the lowest expense ratio in the entire, I guess, retirement planning world, okay? So if you look at it compared to commercial offerings, it the majority of time far and away beats uh, the fees that are charged by other corporations or charged for 401ks, for instance. In fact, if you were to go work for another corporation, your fees would be so high, you know, you would probably actually start to realize that you paid fees. Now, the first thing I want to look at is what are the actual fees that are charged by TSP, by the Thrift Savings Plan. These are things that are important to know. Um, and these, if you've got a pen and paper handy, I'd suggest you write this down just so you have it for your, for your own recollection and you should put it near wherever your financial plan or wherever your documents are. Um, but the TSP has an expense ratio. That's kind of what makes up the expenses that you know you have to pay. And there's actually three things that make up the TSP expense, expense ratio. The first one is the costs of operating and maintaining the TSP's record keeping system, okay? The second one is the cost of providing the services that they provide to participants. So those services are things like allowing you to have withdrawals, allowing you to call um, TSP, or I think it's 1-800-TSP-FIRST, I believe. You can call them and get um, some basic account information help. Now, as far as advice and things like that, they're not gonna help you in that. But there's somebody to call, even though it can be difficult to get a hold of at times. And then the third one is the printing and mailing of notices, statements, and publications. So all of the mailing that they do, that they send out, all the websites they, that they have, and everything like that. Now these are standard fees, but where the TSP really shines is how they're able to keep the fees so low. And this is actually a quote taken from TSP.gov that I thought was pretty cool. Expenses are offset by the forfeitures of agency automatic contributions of FERS employees who leave federal service before they are vested, other forfeitures, and loan fees. Because these amounts are not sufficient to color all the TSP expenses, TSP participants share in the remainder of the cost. Okay, so rather than pocketing the contributions of FERS employees that end up leaving service before they're vested, uh, they just use those, I guess, somewhat to pocket, but in reality, just to offset expenses. So I think it's a kind of a cool model they have of how they're able to keep them so low. Now, are they gonna be able to keep them that low forever? Yeah, I don't know. I kind of see them continuing to increase, especially if they start to add more features, which, you know, who knows if they'll add more features, but if they do add more, say, withdrawal options and things like that, then the fees are probably gonna go up as well. Okay, so what exactly are the fees that you're paying? For 2015, and this is an average because there are so many funds, but the average expense ratio was 0.029%. So for every $1,000, that's essentially 29 cents. If you go up for $100,000, because quite a few of you probably do have $100,000 or more in your TSP account, that's actually $29 per year you're paying to invest in the TSP. Okay, so is that a large amount? No, that's actually a very low expense ratio and one of the, one of the best reasons to invest within the thrift savings plan. Now that we know that the expense ratios are low and we see you know, kind of what we're paying for, what do you get for paying for that? 
okay? Because that, that's the next question. You're paying something. What actually do you receive in return? And, and I've kind of listed, I don't know, five, six, seven or so points that you get and things that you actually don't get versus something you get, say, in an IRA, an individual retirement account outside of the federal system, okay? So if you were to invest elsewhere, kind of what the differences are between the TSP and an IRA. Okay, and first and foremost, you get the opportunity to participate in the various TSP funds. Okay, that's that's one of the biggest ones. You get, you're able to invest your account in the TSP funds. Those are the C, S, I, G, and F. If you aren't aware of kind of what's involved in those and kind of want an overview and some help in deciding how to invest in those, if you actually click up here, this is actually a TSP reference guide that I've created, kind of called a, a somewhat of a cheat sheet. If you sign up for the newsletter, I'll send it to you free of charge. It's a PDF. And I have a lot of clients who have just, you know, basically laminated it, put it on their wall, and that's been able to help them quite a bit. The TSP funds, they range in in everything, whether that's in what you're investing in, what companies, what funds, um, I guess kind of what they track. So for instance, the C fund tracks the S&P 500. Actually the C and the S fund make up pretty much the entire stock market in the US, okay? So if you're looking to invest in the total stock market in the US, that's the C and the S fund combined. Okay, so those are the funds that you have available for investment. You also have the G fund, which is a safe guaranteed fund. Um, I've done a video in which I talked about whether the G fund actually beats inflation or matches with inflation, and they are close. Uh, you can click here to find that. But the returns in reality aren't bad, okay? And that's actually a topic I'm gonna st save for a little bit later. But the next one, another thing you get with the TSP is mailed correspondence, okay? So that, that's not really that special. Everybody knows that they get stuff in the mail from TSP, but it's important to talk about because there probably are some companies, not any that I know of, but I'm sure there's companies out there that don't mail stuff out to you enough. Uh, but TSPs, as far as the way that they put their information together so you can read it and understand it, it's actually pretty good. I actually like it. Along with that, you also get um, an internet application. So you're able to have a portal that you can go online, that you can look at your account. There's a few different things you can do in there. Um, and that's one of the, in my opinion, one of a very underutilized service that the TSP has. If you have a TSP, I highly suggest you log in there at least, you know, once a month, every couple weeks. That way you can kind of see you know, what's going on in your account if you need to make changes, what you're actually earning, and uh, what fees are being taken out. Now, one thing that you do get with the thrift savings plan is limited allocation changes. So what I mean by that is you're actually, they allow you to only change your allocation within the CSI, G, and F, and the L funds um, every so often. So they don't allow you just a maximum amount of changes, whereas, say, you could have within an IRA. Okay, so you can actually, this is actually taken from tsp.gov. Um, you can make an inner, inner fund transfer, that's what the transfers are known as, at any time, barring these limitations. The first two inner fund transfers of any calendar month may redistribute money in your account among any of the TSP funds, including moving the entire balance into the G fund. However, after that, if it's within the same calendar month, you can only move money into the G fund. So what they're saying is you can move it two times, but after that, the only way you can move it is you can move it into the G fund, which you know isn't a bad feature. I'm glad that they allow you to move it into the G fund because let's say you know somebody had moved their money twice, all of a sudden a 2008 crash happens and they're not allowed to move their money anymore. Okay, so what they're saying is they allow you to go to that safe haven known as the G fund at pretty much any time. Now, one thing I would like to see them do is actually have um, you know, charge a fee for more transfers. I think that's something that people would like. If they want to take more than those transfers, just charge a fee for it. I bet people that would really like to use it would use it. Um, but one of the reasons I think they don't do that is they don't want people day trading their TSP accounts at work. I've actually met a few people that, uh, you know, have gotten in trouble at HR for trading too much in their TSP. Um, and so, you know, that's probably one of the things that they limit. However, personally, I think that'd be a good feature for them to add. Another thing you get that's limited is your withdrawal options, okay? And this is a kind of one of those things that a lot of federal employees I talk to 
can't stand, okay? They like being able to have the freedom of taking withdrawals, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's, in reality, in retirement, it's your money. I think it's important to be able to have access to take withdrawals, uh, but the TSP only allows you two withdrawals. They allow you one partial withdrawal and one full withdrawal. Now, within the full withdrawal, there's some other options, okay? You can take, say, a life annuity, or you can you know, set up a monthly income, or you can take it all at once, or you can roll it over. But in reality, if you just leave it in the TSP, I give the example, let's say you took $5,000 out to repair the roof on your home. The next time you took money out, you'd either have to, t you'd have to choose to take it all out. So you'd have to take it out all at once, or choose one of their income options, or transfer it over. Okay, that's very limited when it's compared to say something in the uh, in an IRA. Now, one thing that you do not get with the TSP is a Roth IRA. Okay, you get a Roth TSP, that's definitely for sure, but there's a big difference between the Roth TSP and a Roth IRA. I did a recent video on the Roth TSP versus Roth IRA, what is known as the showdown is what I called it. You can click up here to check that video out if you don't have a lot of information on the Roth TSP versus a Roth IRA. But there's some things that you don't get with a Roth, okay? And the main things that, okay, let's just talk about what you get with a Roth IRA, okay? First of all, you have the ability to withdraw your contributions without tax or penalty at any time. Second, you don't have to include it in the provisional income threshold. The provisional income threshold, also known as PIT or PIT, is actually how they calculate how much tax you have to pay on your social security income. The next one is the Roth IRA. You have no required minimum distribution or RMD at 70 half years old. That's a big benefit. And the last one is you don't have to take proportional withdrawals. Okay, the T Roth TSP is pretty much the opposite of that. You don't have the ability to withdraw your contributions without tax or penalty at any time. You do have to include it in the provisional income threshold. You do have to take an RMD at 70 and a half, and you do have to take proportional withdrawals from both your traditional TSP and your Roth TSP. Okay, those are those are big points. I mean, those. I, I wouldn't really consider the Roth TSP a Roth if it's missing all those features. Sure, it does have some similar features to it, but I wish they would have named it something different. So in reality, you do not have a Roth IRA within the TSP, even if they have something called a Roth TSP that is somewhat similar. The next thing you have is limited investment options, okay? I talked about this a little bit previously, but you have the GF, CS, and I, and also the L funds, okay? That's it, that's what you have to invest in. If you go outside in a Roth IRA, or within an IRA, excuse me, you're gonna have a numerous amount of investment options. Anything from, you know, if you wanna invest in only companies that are, um, I guess, good for the environment, or you wanna invest in companies that match your beliefs, or you wanna invest in mutual funds, ETFs, if you wanna invest in individual stocks, bonds, REITs, I mean, you name it, you can pretty much find it. Um, within the TSP, that's not the case. You only have those five options, plus CL funds, which combine all the five. Now, as far as returns go, this is something about the TSP that's really quite good. The TSP does have pretty decent returns. In fact, they're compared to some of the indexes they follow, they actually sometimes beat them. For instance, the C fund actually beats the S&P 500, which is the actual fund that they're trying to compete with, um, and actually slightly beats it. And so as far as the 10-year compounds, I'll pull up, I guess, a, so you can see the returns here on the screen. The 10-year compound for the G fund is a little over 2%, the F fund is over 4%, the G fund, or the, excuse me, C fund is over 7%, S fund is over eight, and then the I fund is a little over three. Okay, so, you know, the returns on those as far as the 10 year average, that includes 2008. So if you look there and you see the parentheses, that's the year that, you know, you took a big hit. Those are negatives, okay? But the C fund and the other funds have bounced back somewhat, and they have a pretty decent return. Now, the last thing that TSP gives you, or doesn't give you, I guess, whichever way you want to look at it, is limited advice. So if you call 1-800-TSP-FIRST, let me just make sure that's the number. Okay, it's 1-800, or it's 1-TSP-U-FIRST. So if you call 1-TSP-U-FIRST and you get some hourly worker on the phone, no offense to them, but they're really not in the position to give you any advice. Okay, they're gonna help you with some 
I guess maybe accessing your account and things like that. But as far as you know, asking them where you should allocate, um, how much you should take out, all these different things that you know go into a financial plan, they're not going to be able to help you. Okay, but that's one of the reasons you pay such a low fee is because you know you get what you pay for. You're paying for a low fee. You're getting you know kind of a low amount of service. Now, finally, I want to make it clear that not everybody needs a financial planner. That's certainly true. Not everyone needs a financial planner. Not everyone needs a lot of advice. However, in my opinion, everyone does need a financial plan. And a lot of you watching this have no financial plan, have no budget, have no idea what you're gonna do in retirement, have no idea what you're gonna receive in retirement, have no idea how you're gonna withdraw your money so that it doesn't impact you heavily on taxes and things like that. Um, so I suggest you know finding out those things and getting help in that. Okay, so a financial planner can help you in that and other people can as well. But this has been Cooper with FedRetirementPlanning.com. Um, if you have any questions or want to see further videos on other topics, shoot me a comment or an email. Thank you.